to make sure just give me one second I can hear an echo. Uh, I always like to double check. I'm so terrified of that. Uh, hey, everyone. Welcome back to another Jack's Talk. I'm super excited because we have someone really incredible uh, today. Two incredible people apart from me. Uh, Sasha Rush and Christian. Uh, Christian has been the co-host like always. So I'll skip his introduction. Uh, but we're super excited to host Alexander Rush. He goes as Sasha Rush on the internet. Uh, he's an associate professor at Cornell University. And he aims to build NLP systems that are safe, fast, and controllable. Uh, you might have also seen his part, his work uh, with at Hugging Face, where he contributes part time. And uh, today he'll be teaching us more stuff about Jax. We'll be learning how to create extremely long sequences yeah. using his code. Uh, so thank, thank you so much, Sasha, for joining us. Um, thanks, thanks so much. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, cool. I'll get started. I'll, I'll have a chat up if people have questions as we go. Um, so today I'm going to talk about some uh, work I've been doing in a kind of open source and tutorial realm. Uh, it's about generating extremely long sequences. Um, and for this project, um, it was a really nice opportunity to dive deep into JAX and the JAX neural network um, landscape. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Sid Karamchetti, um, who was working or still works with us at Hugging Face. Um, and it's based on a paper known as S4 that was written by Albert Gu, uh, Karen Go, and Christopher Ray. Um, everything I'm gonna describe today is located on this GitHub repo uh, that you can get here. Um, and the slides and uh, code is also available there. So let me first um, talk a little bit of, about kind of high level, uh, what I do, what kind of work I'm interested in, and um, uh, kind of the, the context for this project. Um, so first off, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm a professor at Cornell. I work um, in New York City at uh, a new part of Cornell known as Cornell Tech. Um, I'm also a researcher at Hugging Face, where I work with a lot of great folks there on NLP and machine learning generally. Um, besides that, I like to contribute open source projects. Um, and I'm particularly interested kind of um, as kind of a casual hobbyist in the sort of programming languages that we utilize for uh, deep learning and kind of safe um, uh, mathematical applications. Um, so past work along this realm has been work on named tensors, um, a post about um, the annotated transformer. Um, and I have a little course that I teach based on a, a library called MiniTorch, which is kind of a from scratch um, kind of teaching library that goes through the basics of the Torch programming language. I sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to say it's such an such an awesome framework. I've I've played around with it a lot. So thanks. Thanks for creating it. <laughs> it was fun. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I really learned a lot putting it together and it's fun watching students go through it. I really highly recommend anyone to do it. I mean, we use these libraries so often. And um on the one hand, like they're kind of magic, but on their hand, a lot of it is pretty understandable if you if you dive into the details. So um, uh, yeah, it's been fun. Um, cool. Um, so today's talk um, is not a research talk. It's a kind of a, about a kind of learning process that I went through. Um, so there's going to be bugs and there will unfortunately not be as many citations as I would have liked. Um, so I just want to make that as a quick caveat. Um, and the goals of the talk are going to be to kind of learn about a new machine learning architecture. That's a, that I think is a very promising approach for generating um, extremely long sequences. And to understand um, how JAX supports this, and in particular, I, I wanna emphasize that we're gonna see uh, a system that I think kind of goes beyond the kind of uh, boundaries of some deep learning libraries. Like it, it has some parts and mathematical operations that I think are just hard to kind of do in a kind of generic approach. So. I feel like a lot of the kind of more powerful aspects of JAX really do kind of support this kind of research and this kind of architecture. And I'm a big believer that with kind of better tools, we'll be able to do kind of better research going forward. So before I begin, let me talk a little bit about JAX. So um, I actually have strong feelings about the library. Um, I think it has um, both pros and cons. Um, I'll, I'll start with the cons just to get them out there. Um, 
this project was hard and it was particularly hard because debugging is still quite difficult. I know there's been a lot of kind of advances in the debugging aspect of JAX, but it really is just a lot more difficult for me than, than PyTorch. And I, I understand why people struggle with that. Um, I also um, still kind of feel like there's not really a, a standard for neural networks. Um, and this talk is going to uh, utilize FLAX. Um, and I, I'm using FLAX for neural networks simply because like uh, Google kind of told me to. Um, but I'm not convinced Flax is like really like got it totally yet. It has a lot of really cool things about it, but it has a lot of warts that that came up in the in the part of the project. Um, and then the last thing is that I I still kind of struggle a little bit to reason about some aspects of Jax. Um, like I don't totally get the the semantics or, or particular aspects about the the neural network semantics. And I know there are a lot of tutorials out there, but some of the times I kind of fall between like really in depth, like here's how XLA works to like a little bit too high level for me of like, here's how you build kind of the three models that people use in deep learning. Um, okay, but those are the cons. I think the pros are what really excite me and why I dived into this project. Um, I, I really, really, really think it's a kind of transformative idea that JAX actually allows you to separate the math from the rest of your model. Uh, and this facilitates testing, it facilitates difficult modeling. And we're really gonna see that in this project where there's no plausible way I would have been able to keep track of like seven different dimensions going on. And the fact that JAX actually lets you abstract that away is, is, is really quite uh, transformative. Um, there's also aspects of the JIT that just continue to really impress me. Um, and at the core uh, of this, this talk, there'll be an operation that's quite simple, but in, in practice, the PyTorch code had to call out to an external library where the JAX JIT is able just to make it go away. And it really like uh, makes makes the, the model much more usable. Um, and finally, I, I said that I'm not totally convinced by Flax yet, but what I am really convinced by is the fact that they were able to do these kind of lifted transformations. In particular, in Flax, they're able to apply VMAP and scan to kind of entirely parameterized models, which I think is really, really awesome. And it saved us a ton of effort uh, in this project. Um, cool. So um, that's kind of uh, to start with. Now let me talk a little bit about the problem uh, and then we'll dive into the actual model itself. Um, so to give some context, um, the problem we're going to talk about today is sequence modeling. And um, in some sense, sequence modeling is like a hundred different problems. It's it's used in all sorts of different fields and all sorts of different areas of machine learning. But for our purposes, we're going to take an extremely bird's eye view. We're going to refer to sequence modeling as basically anything where we learn over a list of elements. And these list of elements might be discrete or they might be sampled from a signal. We're going to look at several different problems, in, including problems uh, involving text tokens, but also problems involving uh, waveforms or problems involving images. Um, and we're gonna look at two variants uh, and both of these are implemented in our library. Uh, the first is a classification style task. So here uh, we're given a sequence and just for simplicity, I'll represent the sequence as text because that's uh, my area of research. And so given a sequence like, is the dog a good boy? We wanna classify that as yes or no. Um, and in, in, in these settings, it really is just kind of a sequence model into a classification head. The other sort of problem we'll look at is generation, where we're given a sequence of tokens and we'd like to produce the next one. So the dog is a good blank, and our goal is to fill that in. Now, um, this problem is a, a bit more interesting because uh, it really matters that we do it efficiently. Um, if we're trying to generate an extremely long sequence, think like thousands of tokens, we need to kind of quickly generate the next element in the sequence and then move on to the next one and so on as we go. Now, both of these models, um, at least in NLP, are almost universally solved with a model known as the transformer. And we're seeing transformer being used in all sorts of other modalities um, these days, um, including images and other sorts of sequences and tables and basically kind of any problem that I can describe um, similar to the form in the previous slide. And uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the transformer besides just noting that it's kind of completely uh, ubiquitous. So um, 
any kind of sequence modeling, you're going to apply this sort of approach to. It's kind of underlying BERT, it underlines GPT-3, it underlies um, the first Dolly and a bunch of bunch of different models that, that we've seen. Uh, and the key thing to note about the transformer is that it, its internal operation is a kind of sequence modeling operation that requires every position in the model to look back at every previous position. So if we want to generate a sequence, like my dog is a good blank and produce the next word boy, we have to look back upon everything that we've created so far in this process. So we have um, this self-attention operation where our memory is everything that we've seen so far up until this point. And I, I kind of have a little joke going, which is that um, uh, Transformer has been kind of so dominant in NLP that it's basically the state of the art in every problem we're working on. Uh, and I have this bet going with um, uh, Jonathan Frankel uh, about whether this will be true in five years or not, like whether this operation will still be the most dominant thing in NLP. And uh, the clock is ticking down. I think I have about four and a half years left. Uh, and our current status is that, yes, basically this operation is, is all you need to uh, calculate. Um, but there are some weaknesses with the transformer. And one weakness is that this kind of full memory, this kind of full self-attention is rather expensive. As we add new words, particularly in a generation context, we have to keep around our memory of everything else that we've seen so far. So the amount of um, computation we're going to do is going to scale um, uh, quadratically with the length of the sequence. And this isn't anything kind of specific about the neural network of the transformer. It's just a kind of inherent property of self-attention as an operation. So it's just kind of baked into the idea that you're going to need to look at everything else previously. Uh, you're going to kind of scale in this way. Um, and so because of this problem, um, there's been kind of a, a cottage industry of comparing transformers with different architectures. Um, and one architecture in particular is the one that kind of dominated before uh, the transformer took over. And this is the recurrent neural network architecture. And in recurrent neural networks, there's just this inherent assumption that you're not going to have to remember everything that you've previously computed. You're, you're going to just have this bottleneck that all of your memory has to be a fixed size, and you're going to utilize and update that memory over time. And so again, kind of accepting the details of this architecture, it's just important to note that this is going to scale um, in a kind of much better way, but it's going to require you to kind of do this sort of compression as you go. And I think because of this, uh, we saw a, a really sharp change in NLP and other fields from RNNs to transformers as transformers just seem to scale better with data and perform better kind of across the board in core benchmarks like machine translation and other forms of classification. Now, I mentioned that this kind of N squared problem uh, is kind of in, in the air right now. And over the last couple of years, there have been a lot of different models that have um, kind of targeted methods to get around the quadratic scaling of transformers. So here are about uh, 10 different methods that people have proposed. Um, and this is from a benchmark known as Long Range Arena that came out from Google that tries to kind of classify how good these different kind of scaling transformers do on various tasks. And uh, there are about six tasks here, and all of them are kind of uh, picked because they have very long range dependencies and very long, uh, very uh, high number of tokens to work with. So I don't think these are kind of inherently important tasks for the various fields, but they do kind of demonstrate the kind of difficulty of handling very long sequences. And the key thing to note from this slide is that um, for a lot of these tasks, the models are not doing particularly well. And not only are the, um, um, the fast models not doing well, the models kind of uh, on this part of the, the slide, uh, transformer is even failing on some of them. So kind of uh, a, a raw transformer without any tricks uh, fails on some of these tasks. So we'd like to kind of both improve on transformers performance and also improve on these kind of fast uh, variants of transformers that get used in these other columns. 
And let me focus in on one of these tasks that I think um, it's, it's relatively interesting. So I mentioned that I work on natural language processing, but uh, these tasks are really cross modality. You can see that they, they have uh, the first one is kind of uh, almost like a programming languages task. The second one is a text task. The third is information retrieval. And then the fourth is image. And then uh, these other ones are also images as well. Um, and so how do we kind of turn all these tasks into a sequence task? The way we do it is kind of doing it in the most naive way you could imagine. So we're just going to linearize or, or make sequential some of these uh, data sets. So to take this image, we literally just kind of flatten it uh, and then read it left to right, pixel by pixel to do classification or do prediction. Um, and I think this is like pretty counterintuitive. It, it, it kind of breaks a lot of locality in the underlying image. Um, and, it, um, and it kind of requires you to have very, very long-term memory to even kind of figure out that two pixels were next to each other uh, along the row axis of the original image. And just give you a sense of what some of these tasks looks like. Um, this is the path X task that uh, kind of uh, raw transformers were not able to solve. So this is uh, what you get. You get this image. So you're going to like linearize it. So you start from the first row, go through, go through each of the columns and feed that to the model. And the result of the model is that it has to tell us whether or not the two white dots connect. So whether this dot connects with this dot. So it has to basically uh, realize that all these other paths are basically spurious and then figure out that there is a line from here to here and that they are connected. Um, and there are uh, variants or other images that you can see that will kind of not be connected. But I think as a human, it's pretty easy to see that they're connected in this way. But imagine like if I gave you a list of pixels kind of starting from the, the, the top row how hard that would be to kind of figure that out. Cool. Um, so that's the context of the work. Um, I'll, I'll stop there if anyone has any uh, questions to get started. Um, there are no questions from the audience yet, but maybe Christian has a few. Mm, I, I, I do have some, but it's weird because we haven't explained the S4. Okay. Uh, so it doesn't make sense right now. <laughs> I'll keep going. Sounds great. Um, okay, great. So let's um, let's dive into the actual project uh, in this work. So um, we're going to look at this paper called Efficiently Modeling Long Sequences with Structured State Spaces. And the kind of high-level idea of this work is that we're going to learn a new approach for learning long sequences. Um, this approach is going to allow us to basically learn very long distance dependencies. Um, and we're going to be able to train our model in such a way that it's able to actually learn from these long distance dependencies from the data. But then when we actually use the model in practice, we're going to be able to use it as a recurrent neural network. So the final thing we're going to get to is going to look like this model here, where it acts like an RNN. Uh, and in fact, it acts like a very simple RNN. It's going to be just a fully linear uh, recurrent neural network. But because of the way we train it, we're going to actually be able to train it to learn these very long distance dependencies and do very well on some of these tasks. So just to give you uh, a sense of the punchline, so the results in S4 show that this model, when uh, run on the long range arenas uh, benchmark, is able to do extremely well. It's able to do much better than a, a bunch of different uh, kind of uh, fast transformer models. And it's even able to outperform the transformer on a lot of tasks, uh, including um, getting a relatively high score on the path X benchmark, which is this benchmark that these previous models were not able to solve at all. OK, so the kind of high level challenges for us are that um, this model is quite mathematically complicated. Uh, and so um, actually understanding all the details of how it works is um, I, well, it was definitely beyond me when I first started. But it also, I think, is intimidating for a lot of folks who want to use these models in practice. The other aspect that I think is really important is that we want to be able to test this model. So I want to be able to have kind of unit tests that it respects kind of the mathematical properties that are claimed from the paper. And to do that, I don't want a kind of pile of neural network code. 
I want actual kind of mathematical functions that we can test directly. I mentioned before that some of the core operations require an external library to run in Torch. And we'd like to use uh, Jack's JIT to get around that issue and make it run fast. And finally, um, it seems like there are other uh, methods that are coming out that utilize a kind of similar structure of S4. So we'd like our library to be extensible and kind of separate out the different mathematical concepts so that we can quickly adapt to new papers. And in fact, I'll conclude the talk by showing some code for a, a new work that just came out that we're releasing in the next couple of days. Cool. And then um, the actual way we're going to do this is we're going to write a concise uh, pedagogical literate code uh, implementation that uses JAX and FLAX. Great. Um, so the project is called the Annotated S4. Uh, you can check it out at this link. And let's see, actually, if I can. Sasha, can I ask you a question from the chat? Yeah. People are wondering if a convolutional network can solve the, the path, the X path task. Um, it's a good question. Um, I actually don't know offhand. My guess is that a convolutional network, given the 2D structure of the image, probably could solve this task pretty, pretty straightforward. So I think part of the task is kind of like doing it from kind of the raw data of the task itself. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is kind of a contrived task that forces the long range transformer, I guess, to, to squeeze all their power, something like that. Yeah. So, um, actually let me, let me talk through some of the different tasks we're going to look at just to give people a sense of which ones are contrived and which ones are not. So, um, we're going to look at, at, at several different tasks. Um, we're going to look at both image classification and image generation. And so in these sense, uh, these, these tasks are a bit contrived because um, you are kind of trying to generate an image by its pixels or classify an image uh, by its pixels. Uh, and so in these cases, you really could utilize the kind of full structure of the image itself. You'd obviously do much better uh, than, than trying to kind of process it in this sort of long range sequence. However, there are a lot of tasks that this model uh, applies to that, that that's not true for. So one task we'll talk about is speech generation. So in speech generation, you really want to produce speech in the kind of format of a wave. So you can do classification by converting it to um, a different format, such as MC, M MFCC. Uh, but for speech generation, you really like kind of want to do it on the waveform itself. And so in, in this task, it really is just an extremely long sequence that you get as its input. And in this case here, the, the orange is our input that we're getting, and the blue is our completion that we actually want to produce uh, from the model itself. So uh, while some of these image tasks are a little bit contrived, some of these other ones really do kind of have the, the property of just being an extremely long 1D sequence. Um, great. Um, so, and then just to summarize, so the, the tasks we'll look at in the blog post are, are these kind of image generation, image classification, from sequential sequences, as well as sound classification and sound generation directly from um, the, the waveforms themselves. Um, cool, Christian, were there any other questions or should I keep on going? Uh, no, I think people are discussing around the convolutional layers, but I think you covered it. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I, I, I don't think I really wanna overclaim that this is like, the way you should do image processing. Um, but uh, there, there are a lot of kind of sequential tasks that uh, we don't have as clear like a model from uh, that, that image processing. Um, okay, cool. So that's the background. Let's dive into the actual implementation. So I'm gonna cover um, the implementation in three parts. Um, this is the part of the talk where things get a, a little bit more mathy. Um, but in part one, um, I think everything should be, in theory, kind of understandable uh, as we go. Um, part two gets a little bit more complex, and I'll mostly kind of cover it um, at a high level. And then part three, we'll dive into some of the particular implementations of the model. So part one covers a kind of classical model known as a state space model, or an SSM. This is a model that had been explored uh, by various different authors as a machine learning model. 
It's um, actually a relatively uh, straightforward model, and uh, we'll, we'll dive into some of its details. So this part of the talk um, really does cover the core structure of what we get out of the system, uh, but we'll see that it's not kind of trainable directly uh, by itself. Um, so let's talk about what a state space model is. So um, a state space model is going to map a 1D input signal, which we're going to call UT, to an ND latent space, which we'll call XT. And then finally, it's going to map it back to a 1D output signal. So let me make some of the terms clear so we can work with them. So U is our input. And when I say signal, I mean it's a continuous function uh, from um, 1D to 1D. So we're going to have a uh, continuous time as our input. And U will be just a function that transforms time into some value. That's going to be our input to our system. So you can think about this as like the true waveform that comes into a speech system um, or kind of the true, the true kind of light uh, in the world. Now, we're going to then map this to an ND latent state. So that is going to be a, a function uh, from time to uh, an n-dimensional vector, and we're calling that x. And that's going to be some hidden or latent state that keeps track of all the different properties we need in order to transform our signal over time. And finally, we're going to produce this output y, which again is a kind of continuous function over time that is a projection of this hidden state. Now we're going to define this by the following equation. So this equation says that the derivative of x is equal to uh, our transformation a of the signal xt uh, plus b times our input ut. And then our output, the y signal, is this transformation or projection c of our latent state x. Now, the key uh, kind of parameters that we need to take away from this system are A, B, and C. So A is going to be the transformation of the hidden state over time. B is the input, or the, what we take from the input signal U. And then C produces our output signal at the end. And the thing I want to note is that this system, um, while it looks familiar, is going to be continuous. Uh, and so it's different. Uh, for folks who've kind of worked with kind of discretized systems that transform their values over time. And at the bottom, we're just going to have our uh, parameter initialization. Um, we'll just, I just wrote this down to give you a sense of the sizes of the various objects. So A is going to be most of our parameters, it's n by n, whereas B and C just transform our input and then transform our output. Okay. Now, in practice, we're not going to actually work with the direct speech wave signal as a signal itself. We're going to discretize it, and we're going to discretize it based on some sampling rate. So what we're actually going to take an in input is a sequence of these uh, scalar values, u0 through ul minus 1. So in the case of speech, that will just be uh, the sampled signal. In the case of language, it, it might be some embeddings or a dimension of an embedding. For um, um, uh, for, for for images, it's just going to be each of the pixels in the way we described before. And the key thing we need here is we need a step size uh, delta, uh, and that's going to represent basically our sampling rate uh, for the underlying signal. Now, there are many ways to discretize these kind of models. Um, one of them is this equation here, which is a bilinear transform. Um, I won't go into the details too much, uh, except to note that this discretization turns our original uh, matrices A, B, and C into these A bar, B bar, and C bar uh, matrices. And these basically tell us how to approximate our original um, uh, uh, state space model with a discretized uh, state space model uh, with a kind of transformation of the parameters. And in fact, in practice, we're gonna really be learning the underlying true parameters and doing this discretization on the fly at each time step. So uh, at the bottom, I just have the code for how we do this in JAX or in NumPy, uh, and it's a pretty straightforward application of 
uh, matrix operations. Okay, so what does this give us? So the discretization from the state space model to A bar, B bar, C bar gives us a new equation where instead of working with differential equations, we're now working with um, something that looks much more like an RNN. Um, and in fact, uh, in the paper, they kind of just view this as being a linear uh, recurrent neural network. So I'm going to use subscripts to represent the discretized time steps. So now instead of working with a uh, continuous signal UT, we're working with U sub K, uh, which is um, the kind of sampled part of our original signal. We then transform that with B bar and then update our hidden state uh, X sub K minus one with our matrix A. Um, we keep on doing this at each time step to produce the next step in our sequence. And just as a reminder, uh, U and Y here are still just scalar values, whereas um, this XK represents um, the, the, the hidden state uh, and it, it, is it going to be an n-dimensional vector. So to implement this in JAX, we're just going to apply JAX scan. We have our little step function that just updates um, our internal state and returns our uh, XK and YK values. Um, so um, kind of as you would implement recurrent neural networks anywhere else in JAX, we have it in this function here. Okay, so let's do a quick tangent just to get a sense of what these models are and what they do. Um, so to do this, we're gonna look at an example from mechanics. So in this example here, we're gonna have a mass, it's on a spring. And we're going to try to basically understand the position of the mass as we apply a force to it over time. So in this example, our input signal U is going to be the force that's applied to the mass, and it's going to be moving in one dimension. So its position YT uh, along one dimension will change as a force is applied to it. We can write down the equation for this uh, at the bottom here. Uh, this tells us basically how the, the mass M uh, with spring constant K and friction constant B changes its position over time. So this equation here is just kind of a like um, kind of undergraduate mechanics uh, equation relating the velocity acceleration uh, and the position of an object over time. So um, normally, I, I guess if you looked at this equation, you would kind of solve it in convert it to a state space model just to get intuition about what a state space model does and what a hidden state might represent. So here we're going to uh, represent this equation in matrix form. We write down our A matrix, which tells us how um, the uh, basically hidden state in this model changes over time. We have a B matrix that tells us how the force impacts our velocity and position, and then a C matrix, which converts our hidden state to the final position. So in this case, again, the input U is one dimensional, it's a force. The output Y is one dimensional, it's a position. And the hidden state X needs to encapsulate all the information we have about the current state of the object. And I believe in this particular example, uh, X is two dimensions, and the dimensions are the current position and its current velocity. So that's what it's actually storing in the hidden state. So to implement this in our code, we simply kind of create these matrices A, B, and C below. And then to run the model, we have to give it a signal U, representing the force applied to the object, and then we run our state space model. So let's just look at this in a little more detail. So here's a function um, u. It produces a continuous output over time. I just made up some little function. Um, and uh, we transform that time to an output signal. Now I wrote it as a scalar function, um, but in practice uh, we can use vmap uh, to actually uh, convert it to a function um, over time. Um, and uh, yeah, sometimes in my code, I, I use um, NP vectorize, sometimes I use VMAP. I think they're both kind of nice operations. I like that vectorize actually gives you a kind of uh, explicit signature uh, for your functions. So you can have a sense of actually what's there or, or what you're, you're utilizing. 
Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a, kind of a, a nice way to utilize Jax in order to get kind of um, uh, turn simple functions into functions over vectors. Um, below, we have the actual code for uh, uh, running this model. So we have a bunch of constants representing the physical system. We have L, uh, which is how long we run it for. Our step size here is one over L. Um, so that just means we're sampling it uh, at every one over L um, times the original signal. We uh, use uh, a range to actually uh, compute uh, each of the different time steps. And then we uh, convert our U from a continuous signal to a discrete signal by actually taking the force values at each of the KS times uh, delta time steps. So all uh, the basic time steps between position zero and position one in time. Once we've done that, we simply call our um, scan uh, SSM to run over it uh, in practice. And actually, I think I dropped uh, this should be a scan of discretized SSM because we're running it with the discretized uh, version of the model. Um, cool. So just to put that into context, this is what it actually looks like when we run it in practice. So at the top, we have our force signal, which we've discretized into 100 different positions from time step 0 to 1. That's the input signal that our model gets. We then have the position yk of the model, which changes over time as we apply force. So as we apply force, we push it further from the wall towards the center. We stop applying force. And so it kind of starts getting pulled back to the wall itself. And we can actually see the movement of the object at the bottom of the slide. So not that exciting as a kind of physics demo, but it gives you a kind of intuition about what the model is doing internally and how it's kind of tracking uh, the signal and memorizing uh, kind of what it what it did to push the model, uh, the, the object forward. <clears throat> Great. Um, so given this model, our goal is going to be to train a neural network that utilizes a state space model as its internal time series model. So I don't want to I don't want to claim that this is going to just totally get rid of neural networks altogether. That actual model we're going to build is going to stack a bunch of feedforward layers with SSMs in between. So really what the SSM is doing is kind of replacing the self-attention layer of these networks. So basically imagine a transformer, you pull out the self-attention and you put some of these SSMs in between. But the problem is that so far, all I've described is a state space model that looks like a linear recurrent neural network. So we've seen that this kind of model is very fast for generation, but unfortunately it's actually not that fast for training and it's pretty difficult to train in practice. So we'd like to kind of uh, get the model that I just described by training a different model that has the same underlying mathematical properties. So the key insight of this paper are gonna be, or sorry, the key insight that we're gonna utilize in the second half of this paper is that we can write a state space model as a convolutional neural network. So instead of kind of writing it as a recurrent neural network, we're gonna write it as convolutions, which are slow for generation, but fast and more stable for training. And then the second property we're going to utilize is a, a method for initializing the parameters of this model that's just extremely effective and allows them to learn really long-term sequences. Cool. So let's talk through that. Um, and I think probably the next three slides, uh, if you're going to kind of focus in on the mathematical ideas, are probably the, the most critical thing to understand. Uh, this trick is really nice and it's utilized in, in a lot of papers besides uh, this one as well. Um, but it really does kind of give you intuition about why this is going to be possible. So the key idea is that unlike a recurrent neural network, the, or, or sorry, unlike a kind of nonlinear recurrent neural network or like an LSTM or the, the kind of models that are common to, to, to use in, in this space, the 
the, the SMM model is going to be fully linear. And because of that, we can apply this unrolling trick where we write out the, an equation for the hidden state based on all the previous calculations that we've done to get up to that point. So we look at this equation. This is saying that xk is equal to a bar times xk minus 1 plus buk. What that means is that at the first time step, we don't have a previous x uh, negative 1. So, so, so this first term is 0. So it's really just b times the input signal at that time, uh, u sub 0. y 0 is then the output matrix C times B times U0. At time step X1, we're going to have A bar times X sub 0, which means if we substitute in X0 for that position, we now have A bar B bar times U sub 0 plus the new U1 that we've gotten at that time step. When we output y1, we multiply this output c bar times both terms here and here. If we do this step again, we just unroll one more term and we get um, a squared b u0 plus a b u1 plus b u2. And we get a y output that has c a squared b u0 plus CAB plus CB. Now the key pattern to notice here is that the calculation of our output Y2 really doesn't need to know anything about the hidden state X. In fact, it just needs to know each of these values times the input U0, U1, U2. And this value here is just gonna be a scalar that changes only based on the powering up of A that happens at each time step. However, this does get extremely long. By the time we get to YL, the last value in our output sequence, we're going to have a term for every one of the previous U's that we have gotten. So if you have this kind of sliding window, the length of the window is going to be the length of the entire sequence. So if we have a sequence of length L, uh, where L is 16,000, we're going to have 16,000 different coefficients that we need to multiply by each of our different input values, U0 through UL. Now, this can be written as a kernel of length L, where this kernel, which we'll call K bar, is equal to this term below. And this kernel is really the kind of key mathematical aspect to take away from this work. We're going to basically create this kernel K by multiplying our discretized C times our discretized A to the power of the position times our discretized B. And if we have this, we multiply this last term by the first term in the sequence and keep on going across the sequence itself. So this kernel is a convolutional kernel but it looks very different than kind of the convolutions that we typically use in areas like computer vision, just because it doesn't have a small fixed size. Its size is the entire length of the sequence itself. Note that uh, it also kind of gets applied at every position. So it slides all the way across, uh, kind of going outside the boundaries of the input itself. So luckily, this sort of convolution is exactly the kind of thing that we use uh, Fourier transforms to efficiently compute. So because the convolution is so big, we don't have to compute it by actually sliding the window and doing this multiplication. We can compute a Fourier transform of the kernel K, a Fourier transform of the input uh, signal U, uh, apply them together to compute our output sequence Y. And sorry, I keep on saying signal, I mean to say sequence. So it's a convolution of our input sequence by our kernel K bar. So we can look at this in two ways. So they're, they're both equivalent. So one is just applying a standard convolution between our input sequence and this very, very long kernel that we computed. 
if you run it this way, probably most of the time it will actually try to, 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 to compute the convolution as a sliding window. If you compute it this way, it instead applies um, two uh, fast Fourier transforms, then applies the convolution uh, in Fourier space, and then converts it back to our uh, output Y. And so this actual uh, convolution can be computed much more efficiently and allows us to do efficient training uh, for this model. OK, so there's one last trick, and then I will stop for questions. Um, so the um, final thing that we have to note is that you can apply this model, and you'll get basically what you might expect from running a linear recurrent neural network. That is, linear recurrent neural networks by themselves are just not very good. If linear recurrent neural networks just did awesomely on these tasks, we would have known about it um, like years ago. Um, and in fact, if you try to apply this model to MNIST classification, you only get about 50% accuracy. However, if you initialize your hidden states in a particular way, which is known as a HIPPO matrix, you can improve this number to about 98% accuracy. And uh, this, this is done by the matrix I'm showing here. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty simple matrix, um, but it has this kind of really nice property um, that it's kind of able to improve the performance of these models. Now, the derivation of this matrix uh, and, and why it performs so well is really kind of very much beyond the scope of this talk and this blog post. But let me try to give you a little bit of a sense of what's going on. So the, the intuition that you want to have is that um, this matrix is trying to keep track of everything it's seen previously in you. So it's trying to produce basically a summary of the function u over time. And if we can produce a summary of the function u, then we don't need to remember everything about u. We can just keep track of the coefficients, the n different uh, coefficients in our latent state over time. So here we have these n different coefficients. That's just a, 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 a matrix of, of, of size one by n. And then here is our u. And the argument put forth in the HIPPO paper is that this matrix, this particular set of equations here, computes an approximation to this function by storing coefficients of a Legendre polynomial. So each of these represent basically the set of underlying basis functions um, that it, it's using. And if you multiply this value by this function and this value by this function, and sum them up all together, you'll get something close to this red line. So in that way, we're able to store enough information in our hidden state that we don't need to save everything about the U we've seen so far. We just save these coefficients. And if we wanted to, we could reconstruct the underlying function behind it. So this initialization gives us a, a kind of way that we can utilize a recurrent neural network to get the kind of properties that we like in a transformer, the kind of the memory of our signal over time. Cool. Um, so um, let me, well, actually, before I get here, let, let me just pause for a second if there are any questions. Let's see. I, I think there are none. <laughs> Just okay. as a, There's okay. a discussion going on in the YouTube chat. Um, <laughs> I think people are answering each other's questions. Okay. Sounds great. Uh, Christian, did, did you have any that you wanted to highlight from here? Um, no. I, I, I personally, when I first saw the Hippo Matrix, I was kind of, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> um, like, what I have trouble understanding it, it's like a triangular matrix so that makes sense because i mean the first one should only see probably itself and that kind of stuff i'm um, soup and, and the diagonal is n plus one that's kind of what i get the other term is like i i, I it seems like black magic like 
Yeah, I, I, I don't I don't actually have a simple way to understand this matrix. Um, I think that the Hippo paper does kind of go through the derivation for, for why it, it obeys these properties. And so I think that's a, a good way to, to go through it. But I don't think there's going to be anything I can tell you that's like makes it super clear why it's like the right starting point uh, for the system. I, I do have a question. I, I guess this is in general, because even if you have this clever matrix, it's still kind of a linear system. Right? That's right. Yeah. So so, <laughs> so linear systems are, are powerful as long as you get the right number. That's kind of the, the idea. I, yeah, I think that's what's so startling about this is that um, uh, this, this really is just a kind of linear system. And uh, I don't think there's any inherent reason why uh, why a linear system can't work. Uh, it's just surprising that it does. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, the I should be, I, sorry, go for it. No, go ahead. I should be clear, though, that this is, again, just the time series part of this model. So, uh, and actually, actually, maybe that's a good time to, to talk about what the model actually looks like. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a layer. So this is a kind of an S4 layer, and this is what it looks like. So this part is going to have A, which is our hippo matrix. We're going to have N and L, and then we're going to learn three parts of this. So we're going to learn B, we're going to learn C, and we're going to learn our step size. So learning the step size allows us to kind of learn different kind of um, varying sequences of the underlying model. So kind of like uh, have different different uh, SSM layers kind of act at different scales. Then really, this is the code. We're going to discretize and we're going to compute K. And the one thing I want to note is that this is a little different than what we normally do in, in kind of neural network models. This computation all happens during the setup phase. So none of this actually depends on our input. It's just basically reconstructing the kernel every time the parameters change. And so at, at test time, you actually don't need to rerun this at all. The only thing we actually run at test time is just this convolution. So it really does just look like calling this convolution function for our input. Now, as I mentioned earlier, though, we're, we want a lot of these, and we want to put them within another nonlinear system. So we're going to have a, a bunch of SSM layers, then we're going to have uh, a big fat feed forward network, and then we're going to have a bunch of SSM layers, and then a feed forward network. So I'm not saying that you don't need nonlinearities. It's just that you don't need nonlinearities in the kind of time series part of the model. Cool. Now, the other thing I want to note about this code, and maybe everyone here kind of knows this already and thinks it's cool, but like this implementation is entirely scalar. Like uh, this is a scalar time sequence that gets us input. Um, and so to actually run this thing, we're going to need like a ton of these and a ton of them per batch. So uh, in the PyTorch code, you have to kind of keep track of a bunch of extra dimensions to keep track of all the different copies of the parameters and uh, keep track of the batching and, and all that. But we're just going to do that uh, by using flax. Um, so I think this is kind of a, a really neat aspect that that, that uh, Flax Linen has built in, which are these lifted transformations. So we're going to apply two different lifted transformations. Uh, the first is a VMAP that produces new parameters with their own random initializations. So in order to uh, work with, uh, say, uh, a time series with many different channels, we're going to have h different channels that we create by simply lifting the layer I showed before so that, such that each of them have their own parameters and the parameters are initialized randomly. Then to get batching, we're going to lift it again, but this time not creating new parameters and not creating new initializations. So throughout the code, we basically have all the kind of math part of it separated from these kind of lifting aspects and the neural network part. Uh, which yeah. Is Sasha, can you explain? Because this is, I, I think this is one of the most interesting 
aspects, but I, I, like it, it seems, uh, I guess, a little bit magical from the outside. Like, uh, can, can you explain what like the lifting is, is doing to, to the parameters? Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> I agree. The syntax is a, a little magical, but let me try to describe. So here is a, this is a Flax module. It's taking in as input uh, a scalar value and outputting a scalar value. But let's say I wanted it to take in a multivariate time series of 100 values per time step and output a multivariate time series of 100 values per time step. And I wanted each of those to be computed with an SSM with different parameters. So that would um, kind of be a kind of typical use case that you'd have in a neural network. You're just going to have uh, basically a uh, hundred, a hundred of these uh, getting applied uh, as you go. One way to do that would be to add an extra H dimension to each of these parameters and then keep track of that H dimension throughout. That would let us learn an H by N by one uh, parameter matrix. And that is how you'd implement it in PyTorch. This lifting transformation here, though, allows us to say that we're automatically going to VMAP this layer such that whatever the H that it got in its input, let's say there are kind of 100 different dimensions of our time series, you're going to have 100 different randomly initialized parameters. So 100 copies of this layer uh, each of them with different parameters. So that's what this says. It says, take the input axis one, which in this case is 100, and produce an input an output axis one, which is also of size 100. And along that axis, have a split of our parameters and make sure that they're randomly initialized separately. Now contrast that with batching. So in batching, you want to have the same parameters, but get applied to a batch of many examples. So in batching, we'd have, say, a batch of, a hundred, uh, say, a thousand different time series coming in, but we don't want different parameters here. So to do that in Flex, you say the batch axis is dimension zero, and it will be dimension zero when it comes out. Don't use different parameters for each of the, that axis, so they're shared and don't randomly initialize them differently. So there are two different uses of the same function based on how we wanted to actually treat the dimension that doesn't actually get passed in uh, to this model. Does that make sense, Christian? Yeah, yeah no, I, I just, because when I saw it, I was like, oh, wow, this is really neat. And like, you have all these implementations, like for example, uh, like multi-head attention and that kind of stuff that it's, uh, like you could also do this trick. Um, That's right. Yeah. But I don't know. People usually don't. But <laughs> it, it looks really nice when when you see it. Like ah, he implemented it for a single one, and then it suddenly like uh, multi-head and then batched. I found it really cool. This trick you did. Yeah, I think it's really neat. Um, the Flax Linen documentation does have a multi-headed attention example that does exactly what you described. But honestly, like there was so much going on. I had a lot of trouble kind of parsing out exactly how it worked. Um, but, but it is really cool once you see it. Um, I should also note that they have a bunch of these transformations. So you can also do uh, nn.scan. Mm. It, it, does, it does a similar thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, lifted transformations. Um, um, I'm just gonna say for the if somebody sees the video, so so you can do this in in like bare jacks, uh, but the Flax team has like made them like know about modules basically. So so That's you can right, technically yeah. do all this by hand. It's just that it's a lot of work. Um, and and they they construct these these nice APIs that they sort of transform the whole module. Uh, it's 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 really cool. And sometimes 
I've been seeing discussions around how, for example, if you have multiple layers that have the same input, outputs, and parameters, shapes, uh, like, for example, yeah, transformer stack or something like that, you can use scan, for example, to suddenly uh, do like the multiple, yeah, the multiple applications. And then that is also super efficient. Like it, it, it's optimized by XLA, stuff like that. It's, yeah, I don't know. It's yeah, yeah, it's really, really interesting. interesting. Yeah. yeah, I try to, a little bit doing that transformation as well. I think the downside is that it, it causes your your JIT time to 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 get a lot higher. Um, but actually, I I I don't know. I was reading a conversation where where scan actually decreases it by oh, 10x. Really? Well, I feel like I maybe read the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I read it yesterday, so I was like, oh, this is actually even better because um, it, 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 it doesn't, because it, since it's not unrolled, it can actually say, hey, this is just a single thing, uh, like applied multiple times, I guess, with different parameters. Mm. So, so the, the, the code internally, it's simpler. Whereas if you have like a for loop doing it, it, it would try to optimize like a lot of stuff. So yeah. But so, so we actually do have an instance of this in, in this paper. And I was, uh, I, 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 so, uh, let's see, uh, oh, how do I switch? Uh, let's see. Um, okay. So this is a blog post and this came up actually, and I, I think I filed some issues about it. So let me, maybe people are interested. Um, so this is an example of that, where we have a bunch of these layers, one after another, and they're, they're defined in this way. And then we have a for loop that applies them one at a time like this, mm -hmm. right? So this is exactly an example where you'd really like to instead have this be a lifted nn.scan and yeah. then apply them each as you go. And one thing that's really neat about this is that, remember I said that actually a lot of the work for this layer happens during initialization. Mm -hmm. Well, in theory, NN scan could VMAP the initialization. So you have maybe 12 layers, they all get initialized because there's no serial dependency at initialization. They could all be initialized mm -hmm. together. And then you only apply scan here. So a lot of really neat optimizations that are kind of facilitated by kind of that sort of um, structure. Yeah, uh, it didn't work, or it was slow. In your uh, case, I think it. I think it didn't work, but <laughs> I think I, I filed an issue and then never got back to it. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's strange. I, yeah, no, actually, the, yesterday I read somebody that it, that it says, "Oh no, it's even better." Like, mm. uh, yeah, I'll give it a try. Or if, if so. someone wants to send a PR uh, <laughs> who's interested in this, let me know. It's a yeah, really uh, you should share me ah no the link of the code is in the in the blog post uh, yeah yeah no it, it's really interesting i i think it's kind of a different way of thinking about how you do stuff uh the, the these like jack's transformations i guess um yeah it's a it's a little bit of a learning curve but then suddenly you get extra powers i don't know yeah i think that's right um cool um, okay, so um, let me. Uh, oh, I have one other interesting thing to, to that that came up, which was that the other kind of really neat aspect of this model is that I mentioned it has two forms, right? So there's the CNN form during training, and then there's an RNN form which you want to utilize during test time. So you can actually have another implementation of the same layer with all the same parameters. So all this code here, exactly the same. But now we're not going to actually uh, kind of convert it to be a CNN. We're gonna instead discretize it to a discrete uh, state space model. And then down here, we're gonna run our RNN code that actually goes over the state space model as an RNN. But when running an RNN during test time, you're going to have to basically generate and then feed back what you put back into the model. And 
what that means is you're going to run the same model L times in a row if you want to generate a sequence. Now, in practice, if you're generating a sequence of length 16,000, you're going to be calling this function again and again and again. So the way that Flax handles this is it has this thing called self.variable. And self.variable allows you to save state inside of your model itself. So this took me a lot of time to figure out, but it is actually pretty cool. So what this does is it lets us save a state of what our current RNN is at, or basically the current XK, so that we can then utilize that state in the next call. So this saves the state, this utilizes the state as we go. Now, just by itself, this wouldn't be that interesting, but because it plays nicely with all these transformations, this it becomes quite simple. It just becomes saving n values, the current uh, uh, x thing. But when we vmap it, it ends up saving batch times hidden state times n values throughout the whole model itself. So we get kind of locality and caching that then plays nicely with the kind of lifted transformation. Mm. OK, cool. Um, so let's see. So um, I don't want to go too much longer. I've, I've gone for, for a while now. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip part two. So if you're interested in the actual math of the system, um, note that the convolutional function I wrote earlier is extremely naive. So this function here, extremely slow. And so everything was based on this function and all the code before, while technically correct, relied on computing this k-com. So what's really cool about this paper S4 is it gives you this really neat approach for calculating k-com exactly uh, efficiently. And the way to do that plays really nicely with a bunch of JAX functions. So if you're interested in those details, you can come check it out and see kind of how JAX JIT makes it possible to actually implement this efficiently. But what I do want to do is dive into results. So I'm just going to skip through this guy. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about results. So the code we have online um, uh, does a lot of really cool things. So it can classify images by uh, treating the, the pixels as a sequence. So uh, thank you, weights and biases, for <laughs> having me here today. Uh, we have uh, your system implemented. You can try it out. So this is it getting roughly kind of close to state of the art on a sequential version of the CIFAR data set. Um, but as people have noted, like this kind of classification is better to be done with CNNs. Um, what's particularly cool is that we can use the RNN form to actually generate sequences. And so we ran experiments on generating images, uh, generating drawings, and generating speech. So in each of these examples, we're going to use the RNN form, and we're going to basically sample some output sequence and then treat it as an image or as a waveform. So here's the code. So here we're going to use the JAX4i loop to basically uh, generate a bunch of things in a row. Uh, we're going to do that by um, getting a random value for each pixel, applying our model. And as I mentioned before, we're applying it with a cache so it remembers what the hidden state was at each time step. And the cache is mutable, which means that we're going to update the cache based on the next uh, pixel in our sequence. So we're going to apply this basically um, uh, 16,000 times, each time kind of getting our next output while caching the next value in our RNN. Based on our output, we then sample the next pixel and set it in our matrix. And then we uh, kind of apply this again. So this is basically how we run a kind of stateful RNN process with a kind of stacked S4 layer using uh, JAX and FLAX. And the output of this is something like this. It, it, it started from here. It just sampled. And you get basically something that looks like uh, an image. Uh, here you actually get a four out just by kind of sampling from this RNN process. For these examples, we had it complete images. So here we give it all the pixels in white and have it sample the rest in red and compare it to the true image. So it does look different, but most of the time it does kind of reconstruct the original uh, number. So here are some more examples. 
Um, we also applied it to quick draw. So this is a version of quick draw where you uh, basically have a picture of a coat and it has to generate the kind of completion below. So they're not always good. This one kind of misses it, but you get some ideas. Then finally, the last experiment we ran was generating sound. Uh, I unfortunately couldn't figure out how to get sound working in my browser, but you can look at the waveform. So in these examples, you really are generating a sequence that's like 16,000 steps long. Each time step here, you're kind of generating a value between 0 and 256, representing a, a kind of um, a discretized version of the waveform. Um, and you get um, most of these actually look pretty good. And, and if you listen to them, it'll actually sound like someone saying a digit um, compared to the original true value. OK, um, so I'll end there. I'll, I'll note the following. Um, uh, this was a really kind of good exploration for Jax. Um, uh, I don't know what I meant to write here, but <laughs> Jax really shines uh, at uh, modular mathematical code. So uh, particularly kind of getting things in this form lets us test it. It lets us uh, basically confirm properties and make sure the mathematical properties are true. And it separates out the kind of mathematical structure from the neural network. Um, we didn't talk about this so much, but some of the kind of slow operations become really fast when you apply a JIT. And then lifting in flax actually lets us turn that mathematical code into a neural network. So one of the things I'll note is that because we wrote it in this form, it's allowed us to basically uh, kind of use this same structure as new papers on this topic came out. So just a couple of days ago, this paper called Diagonal State Spaces came out, and they showed that you were able to do um, basically almost as well as S4 by basically ignoring part two of this talk and, and just focusing on part one with a kind of more structured model. Um, and this is basically the code for this paper. It's these three functions plus part one of this talk. And we were actually able just to get this up and running uh, basically in a couple hours uh, and get uh, replicated results from the paper itself. Um, so uh, kind of it's nice to have the structure and, and actually basically have it running. Uh, and this is all checked in on the repo if you want to play with it. Um, so thanks very much for listening. And a huge thanks to um, the authors of this paper, uh, the authors of the DSS paper, and a bunch of our open source contributors to uh, the project itself. Amazing, Sasha. Thanks a lot. Uh, do we have questions, Samyam? Uh, Sasha, if you have time, I'll, I'll bring up just one question. Sure, yeah. Um, so this question is by Will Z. Uh, the S4 paper says something about nonlinearities popping up between layers. Even if its building blocks are linear, What is uh, where is that happening? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that was roughly what I, I... And actually, I don't have a slide for this. Let me, uh, let me stop sharing, and then we can uh, share this again. So um, I, I do want to mention that, oh, oops, that's the wrong tab. Um, what I showed, again, is just kind of the intermediate, like the part uh, is replacing a tension. Um, but in practice, you still have um, kind of nonlinearities at, um, uh, at every intermediate position. So here's what our model actually looks like. So it's a, it's a stacked model. It has a, a dense encoder decoder to start and then it's a block of sequences so uh, this is our input this is our intermediate layers so we have a, a self dot layers numbers of these and then we classify uh, and then we kind of produce a softmax as our output now if we look into one of these sequence blocks we can see that it has several things it has um, a dense it has layer norm and it has dropout and it has a GELU. So it has all these things. And then it also has self.seq. So um, this is the S4 part followed by basically a little residual uh, nonlinearity feed forward network here. So we can alternate between applying the sequence over time, then at each position, applying a nonlinearity and a, a feed forward, then kind of applying the sequence again. Um, does that make sense? So this part's all kind of independent of the S4 contribution. Yeah, yeah. So so it's like a transformer block basically, <laughs> with removes 
uh, self attention. That's right. And in fact, I think in the paper, they, they literally have some experiments where it's, it's just a transformer block where they remove self attention. Yes. Yeah, awesome. Um, awesome. I, I, I had I had like a personal question, like if, if you've been tracking the field, um, like where is this going? The like state space, I guess, approach. Like is, is it yeah. evolving? Uh, yeah, so I, I mentioned this 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 paper, uh, this diagonal state space model. Oh, sorry, you can't see my screen. Um, so um, this literally just came out uh, a couple days ago, um, and uh, I think uh, there's been other papers from the original author uh, on various applications like speech processing. Um, but um, yeah, this is the paper I mentioned before. It kind of argues that you can get away with um, a much a much simpler uh, structure, uh, so that's that's pretty interesting. It kind of reduces some of the um, some of the kind of mental complexity of understanding these models, which is nice. Um, I, I I think that like um, I don't know. I'd like to see people try pre-training with these approaches. I'd like to see them try kind of video or kind of um, trajectory planning sort of approaches. Um, yeah, it'd be nice to understand what the limits of uh, these kind of applications are. Um, uh, and I, I think one of the reasons why I'm excited to talk about them and implement them is to kind of reduce the barrier of entry for people to try them out uh, on their own problems. Okay, it's really cool. I do. Uh, th this is something that I thought while I was reading your your blog post. Are are there intuitions onto like what kind of dynamics happen inside this block? Yeah. Um, so one thing I've heard people mention is that the step size seems to matter a lot and each of the different blocks end up having quite different step sizes. So unlike with an RNN where everything has to happen kind of simultaneously on top of each other, step size does give you a sense of like, oh, this SSM is managing long range and this one is managing short term uh, mm -hmm. is, is, is one interesting idea. Um, uh, there are some visualizations in the paper on some of the tasks, uh, but I, it's a little hard to kind of figure out exactly what's going on or what they mean. Um, and particularly when you talk about speech, you can maybe make an argument that like the state-based dynamics have some sort of meaning. They're capturing some sort of lower frequencies or high frequencies or, or vouts. But when you start working with like linearized images or uh, text data, it's a, little, it's a little more unclear what, what they could be capturing. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really cool, especially since you in the blog you started with the an actual like real dynamical system. So, I um, I, I I guess that brings up ideas into oh, is it is it kind of learning like a some behavior that might be useful? Well, obviously it is, but it's it's kind of in the end hard to think about <laughs> it, but it's like yeah. food for thought, I guess. Yeah, and then there's a, there's also a whole question of kind of identifiability. Like, um, I think um, I think under certain circumstances, sometimes it's it's impossible to figure out exactly what the like true state is. Uh, and so, um, so while we're using it like an RNN, it's not it's not it's not totally clear that this is like the right state or it's learned the true latent dynamics of, of an underlying system. Yeah. Sorry, Sasha, I have one last question. Uh, all this paper made me think a lot about Kalman filters. Are they are they related? I was thinking the same, but I was scared to ask media. I thought I was disconnecting with things. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm not the best person to ask about this. But yes, I, I think Kalman filters are a type of state-based model. Um, Kalman filters kind of assume a probabilistic uh, generative process, uh, whereas I think in this case, it, it's not really doing that. So I think it's like a Kalman filter is a, is a specific case of, of this property. Hmm. OK. <laughs> I just had to ask. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, we're, there's a lot you can do with Kalman filters that we're not doing. Like, for instance, we're not really running in France or, I don't know, filtering in a kind of probabilistic sense here. Hmm. 
thanks thanks for asking that question i was thinking about what you did um, but uh, thanks thanks so much again christian for helping make another awesome jack talk happen and of course sasha for the incredible talk it was really an honor to host you and thanks thanks for all the, all your awesome work oh thanks everyone okay it was really fun thanks a lot sasha yeah